Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. If you've been paying any attention at all to the media over the last few years, you could be excused for thinking that artificial intelligence is some hot new Silicon Valley technology. The amount of venture investment, corporate commitment, naive commentary, and just plain hype devoted to AI these days is completely off the charts. Now, there's certainly more people talking about AI these days than ever before. You probably heard the terms artificial intelligence and machine learning mentioned a dozen times already in the meeting. But the idea of an intelligent machine is definitely not a new one. Besides numerous works of fiction over many centuries, we can find substantive consideration of what uh, was called a calculus of thought by the philosopher Gottfried Leibniz back in the 1600s. And many of you are familiar with the provocative thoughts of Alan Turing in the mid-1900s about intelligence and machines. As a field of scientific inquiry, AI generally traces itself back to a seminal conference at Dartmouth College in 1956, where John McCarthy famously first brought the term artificial intelligence into our common vocabulary. <laughs> now, indeed, a, a large number of really spectacular AI achievements have been accomplished over the last decade or so. Many of us in the field feel that it's really quite important to look back and understand our history, both successes and failures, learn from what was done before, and help it to plot our future. That's the subject of our panel here today. My name is Ron Brockman. I'm the director of the Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute at Cornell Tech in New York City and a professor of computer science at Cornell. I was honored to be the director of the Information Processing Technology Office in the early 2000s. And um, I am humbled and honored to be here as your host for this panel to talk about artificial intelligence. Now, I'm proud to say this panel brings together a set of AI pioneers the likes of which you will rarely see gathered in one place at one time. Uh, among other things, our panel represents three presidencies of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, two National Academy memberships, a Turing Award, a Computers of Thought Award, and fellowships from many illustrious organizations. Now, you can read about our esteemed panelists in the conference program so I won't repeat their full biographies. But I, I think that you'll agree with me that even with very brief introductions, these are five people who have had a hugely outsized influence on the history of artificial intelligence, and very importantly, on DARPA's path in AI over the last 50 years. So let me introduce them to you. In alphabetical order, we have first Rod Brooks, Emeritus Professor and former Director of the Computer Science and AI Lab at MIT, co-founder of iRobot, which brought us the PackBot and our little friend, the Roomba, founder, chairman, and CTO of Rethink Robotics, and a winner of IDCI's prestigious Computers and Thought Award. Next to Rod is Tom Dietrich, Distinguished Professor Emeritus at Oregon State University. Tom's a former president of AAAI and also of the International Machine Learning Society and one of the earliest researchers in machine learning. Next to Tom is Dave Gunning, former vice president of Sitecorp, uh, SVP and co-founder of SET Corp, three-time DARPA program manager, clearly a glutton for punishment, and leader of many of DARPA's most important AI programs over actually the last full quarter century. Next to Dave is Bill Mark, MIT PhD in computer science, leader of SRI International's Information and Computing Sciences Division for two decades, and PI on numerous commercial projects and key AI projects from DARPA, including the Kalo project, which you'll hear about in a moment, through which Bill had a very important role in the creation of Siri, which we all know and love, perhaps. <laughs> and finally, Raj Reddy on my far left, University Professor of Computer Science, founding director of the Robotics Institute, and former dean of the School of Computer Scientists, Computer Science, excuse me, at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, former co-chair of the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee under President Clinton, former AAAI president, 
and winner of the ACM Turing Award, among many others. Gentlemen, we're thrilled to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Now back to its very beginning in 1958, DARPA has been at the forefront of support, advocacy, and leadership in artificial intelligence. If you weren't aware of this before today, we hope that you'll leave this session with a newfound appreciation of the profound part that the agency has played in the history of the field, and we hope will continue to play in its future. In this hour, we'll take a look back on DARPA's role in AI's history to help understand how we got to where we are, do a bit of an assessment of where things stand right now, which is not necessarily as clear as it might look, and then take a look forward. Uh, because our time's li limited here, unfortunately, we won't be able to take questions from the audience, but I will do my best to be your proxy in keeping the discussion lively, keeping people on time, and uh, asking questions of our panelists to try to elicit from them the key, key insights they've all developed over the course of their incredible, outstanding careers. So let's get started. The first part of our session, we'll be looking back, do a little bit of history and assessment of where we stand. And then in the second half, we'll do a little bit more looking forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dave Gunning, who'll give us our little uh, ride down memory lane. Dave will share with us a historical perspective on DARPA's leadership in AI. Dave? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, hi, everybody. Nice to see a lot of old friends and people that that had a lot of big hand in creating DARPA's AI story. So I'm gonna give you a little history of AI and DARPA. Do I press this to start? No. Nope. <laughs> Would you back up to, well, never mind. here we are. Um, so DARPA has begun describing AI in these three broad waves, very approximate. We talk about the first wave where people describe knowledge in terms of rules or handcrafted knowledge, build inference systems and that sort of thing. The second wave that we're in the middle of now, where we've learned to really use a lot of data and machine learning techniques to build these models in a much more accurate way. Now the third wave, which is just emerging, and we don't quite know what that should be, but that's a good part of what DARPA is gonna discuss here at this panel, or we're looking for input on, is where should we go next? Where do we go beyond that second wave and create the next generation of technology? Now they asked me to do this, I'm in a pretty unique position because I've actually managed AI projects in all three waves, and I can prove it. These are my badge photos <laughs> from my three tours at DARPA. I don't know who that young guy is on the, on the left there. Um, so let me start, I wanna use this timeline and I'll kind of paint the history of AI over this 60 year period. You see these waves, these are different funding levels, roughly, of DARPA during these different times. You can see here, very clearly, the AI summers and AI winters, right? Which is a phenomenon all of us in AI are familiar with. There's a lot of excitement, some breakthrough. Everybody thinks human level intelligence is around the corner. Lo and behold, that doesn't happen. We get disappointed, you know, and there's a retrenchment. So we're clearly in a summer now. We're not sure if there'll be a winter to follow. Although there also is clearly global warming going on in this story, and each wave is a little bit stronger. So we'll see how that turns out. So we start this story with J.C.R. Licklider, the first director of IPTO in 63, was the creator of personal computing, but he also kind of set the foundation with uh, a decade of work in AI. And here are three of the big accomplishments that came out of that decade. First, the well-named Shaky, the robot, first mobile robot. Uh, the second one, the mother of all demos, you see Doug Engelbart, who demonstrated this incredible demo in 68 that included the newly invented mouse, hypertext, word processing, and distributed collaboration. And then finally, the Harpy speech understanding system was the first limited but successful speech understanding system, and actually Raj Reddy on the end was the PI for that project, and it actually began the second wave, first use of hidden Markov models and kind of statistical techniques. Now during that period, we also funded these intellectual giants that really uh, defined AI in its formative years and to whom we still owe a great debt. 
So we put those items on our timeline. And that speech project in particular kind of started a trend of what would be a continuous set of speech and language understanding projects through all of those decades. So next came Bob Kahn in the 1980s after that first winter was over. In addition to co-creating TCPIP, he kind of instigated DARPA's next big grand project, strategic computing. And strategic computing took on some really ambitious, incredibly ambitious looking back, you know, projects like the autonomous land vehicle and the pilot's associate. Now these didn't work, right? But it really laid the groundwork you know, for the self-driving cars and personal assistance we have today, 20 some years later. So we put those items on the timeline and at the same time they also started a program in image understanding which continued for decades in that area. We have one program after the other kind of plugging away at that technology. So there's a mild winter followed and during that time uh, Steve Cross was a deputy director of CISTO, started the AI planning initiative and in the early 90s kind of led our AI effort kind of set the vision for that decade. Now during this time, AI had split up into a dozen different sub-disciplines. People had given up on the grand integrated AI vision and really tried to plug away at all these individual problems, planning and reasoning, speech and language, sensor and image understanding, and robotics. It was also here where programs like Trek and Tipster we really began to see the second wave techniques take off and proved to be some of the most effective ones in solving these problems. So we add those items to the timeline. And then in 2002, uh, Ron came in, Tony Tether came in as the director, reestablished Dipto, and decided to take another run at big integrated AI. So Ron really had a vision for let's the time to put an emphasis on machine learning, but really look at integrating all the sub-disciplines, see if you can create an integrated personal assistant, was kind of the prototype test problem we had, which gave rise to this PAL program that I managed. Uh, and here you see a couple of milestones from that project. In 2003, we put together a visionary video of really a very grand, ambitious project for a truly intelligent personal assistant. After years of R&D, SRI, led by Bill Mark, worked on a program called Kalo, and they put together this lightweight assistant that could run on your laptop called Kalo Express. As the program ended, SRI spun out this Siri adventure, Siri venture, and what you're seeing there is their first product uh, demo, and they put this in the App Store, they quickly got a call from Steve Jobs who decided this was convincing enough it was time to try it out on the iPhone. And of course, uh, that Siri is a great kind of uh, a co cool effect. It was something cool to tell my kids. But I think the real, probably bigger impact was that for this decade, we funded kind of a who's who in AI today. This is just a sampling of some of the researchers that worked on the PAL project. And you know, now they're leaders in Google and Baidu and, and uh, AI Institute and a lot of places. And of course, we can't forget the Grand Challenge, really kind of uh, led the way in self-driving cars. And if I had a picture of the researchers that worked on this project, you'd see it's the who's who in the self-driving car industry today. So we put those items on the timeline, and I do want to highlight one small, short-lived, but incredibly impactful project that happened at the end of this period, which was one on deep learning. So years before the big breakthrough in deep learning in 2012, Josh Alspector was here as a program manager, funded a who's who in deep learning. It was actually on this project where Andrew Ng first discovered that you could apply deep learning to GPUs. So it was a short program, but at a credibly crucial time. So for the last decade, DARPA's continued to plug away with things like the robotics challenge, you know, in addition, have worked on autonomy, a lot of projects in data analytics and machine learning, and so that kind of finishes out our timeline. Now, I know I have left a lot of people out, right? I promised Ron I'd do this in eight minutes, or seven <laughs> minutes. If I had eight minutes, I would have mentioned your project, but instead, <laughs> let me just list the credits here for this roughly 200 people that contributed to this success story. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, Dave. Excellent. Now, we didn't want to spend too much more time on the history because Dave gave you a really beautiful perspective taking you back uh, almost 60 years. But I wanted to ask our expert panelists to give us a little bit more of a personal view of uh, major leverage points in the history of their areas of expertise, and in particular where DARPA might have played a role. Now, if you know any of these folks, you know that every one of them is a polymath. They are experts in a very wide variety of areas, but for the sake of this panel, I've asked them to think about the areas for which they're perhaps best known. For example, Raj, as Dave pointed out, has a long storied history in speech and language activities. So I'm going to ask each of them to spend one minute reflecting a little bit on an inflection point in their own area where DARPA perhaps played a pretty seminal role and where things would have been different if DARPA had not been part of the picture. So let's start with you, Raj. Okay. Good evening. I'm probably one of the few people in this auditorium who has been part of the ARPA community from the beginning. I was a grad student in John McCarthy's lab in 1963. Stanford was one of the first projects funded by Lick Leiter, Lick Lick Leiter, first AI projects. Speech understanding was one of the early AI projects at Stanford along with vision and robotics and expert systems. And we are still doing those after 60 years. <laughs> it, it, they, no end in sight. DARPA continued this funding in speech technology as, as, as well as other technologies for a long time. These are hard problems. They take tens of decades, maybe many decades. And unless there's continuous funding and continuous understanding, uh, we won't make the kind of progress we need to make. Finally, I want to kind of uh, highlight one thing. Uh, all of you will agree that DARPA has transformed the world in the last 60 years. There's one more thing on the horizon. Using speech and language technologies, we can now bring the other half of the people of the, in the, at the bottom of the pyramid who cannot read or write. You don't, you know, you, you, you know, you don't need to know how to read or write to use our technology. You'll be able to just speak to it and it'll speak back and I'll say more about it later on about what the future might be. Thank you. Thanks, Raj. Bill? I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, major impact in the areas of uh, reasoning and problem solving. And DARPA programs can have impact in different ways. So to start off, um, they can pioneer important areas. My example there is the shaky robot that Dave showed you, um, which was from the mid-60s to the early 70s. It was the first system to combine reasoning with physical action. So it was the first general purpose mobile robot, and it pioneered many of the activities that are going on in robotics to this day. The second thing is that DARPA programs can have near-term impact. Uh, my example there is the DART program, which Dave mentioned, and that was a program of the early 90s. It was put together in very short order, but quite quickly started getting real important results for planning and military logistics that saved a huge amount of time and money when we were at war. So very important program. The third way that DARPA program can have impact is by catalyzing a major activity. And there I'm going to pick DAML, which was a program in the early 2000s that really energized a community of people to start thinking about standards for very large-scale knowledge representation. That led to the semantic web, knowledge graphs, and beyond. Thanks, Bill. Tom. So I think, uh, of course, my area is machine learning. And uh, I, DARPA funded some very early work in machine learning uh, back with Project Mac. 
uh, there was the, the work uh, by Pat Winston in his PhD thesis and some other things. But then there was a big gap. I mean, if you were to plot the machine learning winter from the DARPA perspective, uh, really very little money was spent on that it, until uh, Dave Gunning came on board his first tour <laughs> with the EELD program. And I think we should give some credit to the National Science Foundation, which did a lot of funding of machine learning in those years. But then um, maybe uh, EELD actually is a good example of one of these inflection points because it really introduced the problem of learning uh, structured data over networks, right? The, the internet had exploded and we needed some way to then learn about the structure of links and edges and social networks and so on. And that was, a, a, I think, a very important inflection point and has led to many other things. Uh, of course, I was involved in PAL and, uh, and Kalo uh, and that was a, a, a major investment. I think one of the most important things that came out of that, though, was this capability for task learning, that an end user could teach their computer system to do some task uh, and then automate it without needing a programmer. And that was transitioned successfully to the command post of the future and to a couple of other uh, uh, military systems where people could teach their system to prepare a briefing or a regular report, various kinds of routine tasks. So really speeding things up for them. Great, thanks, Tom. Rod. And I, Let me, you should mention Ted Senator when you mention EELD or we're gonna be in trouble later. Okay. So Ted <laughs> Thank you, Ted. really took that program over. <laughs> I'm sure he was on your credits <laughs> list, right, Dave? Yep. Please, no, I, I want to talk about the uh, DARPA image understanding program that uh, Dave talked about. Uh, I started working in that program in 1977, and it was when a, a time when it was really hard still to get images into computers, but we people worked with uh, all sorts of image sensors, fl FLIR, and um, range sensors, and included sequences of images and moving sensors. Moving sensors was important because you had to sort of understand how you moved in the world. The Autonomous Land Vehicle Project, which started in 1984, uh, had the, the vehicle following roads, doing obstacle avoidance, cross country, using a camera and a range sensor, and it was able to process a frame in only 1.75 seconds, which was quite amazing <laughs> at the time. And then in 1986, Chuck Thorpe, who's just over there, uh, along with Takeo Kanadi at CMU, started the NavLab series of uh, self-navigating robots, which eventually drove on public roads and drove across the United States. And all this led to SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, which was, I think, a big idea, the big idea came out, the coupling of probabilistic methods to geometry. That was a, a real breakthrough, I think, in, in, in conceptual thought. And that's, uh, you know, led to the commercial uh, push in self-driving cars. It wasn't just the DARPA Grand Challenge and the DARPA Urban Challenge. Those two challenges were the capstone of 30 years of sustained funding of image understanding on moving platforms. Great, thank you, thank you all. Um, now, I, we intentionally set this up so each of these folks would tell you a little bit about sort of their vertical area of expertise. But I think all of us share a belief that uh, the original vision of artificial intelligence was largely around someday achieving an integrated system that could uh, get to what people have often called human level AI. Uh, now, that takes progress in each of these vertical areas, of course, some are moving faster than others, but uh, DARPA seemed to have had an interesting role over the years in trying to bring pieces of the field together. Because of the level of funding it could give and it, the fact that it could bring t people together with, from different disciplines and frankly make them work together, um, it, it could have a different role in bringing AI to the fore than, than other funding entities. Um, so I just wanted to ask very briefly, uh, you folks, maybe I'll ask you, Rod, to start. Um, one of the apparent driving uh, forces in the grand challenges, at least the ones that impact AI, are forcing people from different sub-disciplines to work together, uh, perhaps to consider different types of learning and perception algorithms, and trying to build a system that integrates capabilities and works in the real world. Uh, just what's your sense of how important this was? Should it be continued? Is it overblown? Does it take too much money? Do people end up spending all their time working on engineering, not that that's bad, but um, and not moving the science ahead? I, I think the uh, 
the DARPA challenges, including the robotics challenge, have been great, and they have brought people together with really hard physical problems, but they didn't keep doing the same challenge for the next 10 years, which I think goes too far. By doing it just once or twice, getting people working on the hard problems of integration, then it, it feeds the researchers knowing these are the hard problems we have to work on. These are where we had trouble. And so I think it pushes the field ahead more generally than just what you see in the challenge. Great, thanks. Now in a moment we'll talk a little bit more about how intelligence, whatever that actually is, is probably a multifaceted thing, very complex, very hard to build an AI system. But again, not so much from the pure grand challenges, but from other DARPA-initiated efforts, um, people from different disciplines in AI who all used to attend the same conference 40 years ago, um, we forced them back together. Tom, I remember you told me one time that after we put together Dave's PAL program, you saw people at PI meetings and started working with them you hadn't seen in 25 years. Um, and that may, while not necessarily directed at a task-specific outcome, have a pretty significant influence on where the field goals because of the need for people to stay in touch and keep their disciplines cooperating. Not to mention they were heard a little bit earlier today about systems where the parts are moving independently and somehow have to start to talk to and cooperate with each other. We say a few words about sort of top-down control, self-organizing systems, how talent works together in these kinds of initiatives. Well, when we had the PAL program, uh, I was called the chief learning officer of Kalo, <laughs> which meant I had uh, about 16 subcontractors who were working on different learning components in the Kalo system. And uh, part of the challenge there was how to get those different systems to talk to each other. As an end user, you didn't want to <clears throat> first tell your email system, I don't like this kind of message, I like to see this, and then your calendar system, and then your meeting understanding system, and te you have to teach them each the same thing. And so we would made some progress on that, but I think Rod really has it right. It mostly showed us how far we had to go with that. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, traditionally we would build an AI system with uh, an ontology that would describe all of the objects and relations and so on. But this system was too big to have a single shared ontology, and we had adopted one, and then that, that froze all of our design decisions, and, uh, and nobody could make any changes. So, as I like to say, it had all of the software engineering advantages of a giant global variable. And uh, uh, so, so that was a lesson for me that, that in, to really build a large uh, integrated AI systems, we need the components to be able to negotiate with each other about the, their messages and their meanings and not assume that we can fix that once at the beginning of the system. Great. Now, Bill, you were in the middle of this. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, in a good way. Uh, and uh, among the things that SRI brought to the table was, I think it was called the open agent architecture. While it wasn't a top-down specification of standards across the board, it was a way for reasoning, perception, learning, et cetera, components to communicate with each other. But uh, uh, help me reflect on what Tom just said and how that might have impacted the personalized assistant that learns. Well, I think the, the main thing was that we were building a system together. And yes, things like the open agent architecture and some of the other mechanisms we came up with were important to getting the system to work. But really, it was more of what Tom was talking about, of getting people to have to talk to each other and solve problems together. Because their piece of software had to work with this other piece of software. It had to. And that's a wonderful forcing function that DARPA was able to do. Yeah. I'll just add that Tom should absolutely hang on to that chief learning officer title, because that's <laughs> worth at least half a million in industry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, at least. I haven't heard of anyone else with that title. Um, in any case, thanks. Now, now, Raj, one last question, and then we'll turn our attention more to the future. Um, speech work, as we see in Dave's slide, started a long, long time ago. And we've had many speech programs in DARPA and elsewhere that have a set of metrics of various sorts, and it was sort of very easy to work in a siloed way. Um, but in the long run, the, the kind of future you're envisioning really demands at least some level of understanding, if you will, in a system that could intermediate between people who speak different languages, or ultimately in autonomous and semi-autonomous systems that we have to talk to, command. How, what's your sense of speech's separateness from the rest of AI versus its integration? 
the, the speech is an integral part of AI. You know, you cannot understand without all the other pieces together. <laughs> so in that sense, but even reasoning and planning come in when you say, order me some groceries, Alexa, you know, <laughs> whatever. It has to think We talk through. Siri here, not Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so I think speech is going to be a central component of all the systems because most of the world, most of the people on the, on the planet, whether you're literate or not, speak. And they see, they walk. But they don't all know how to read or write. So in that sense, if you want an inclusive society, you need to kind of build systems in which speech is an integral part of it. Right. Um, lots more to talk about, about what we've been through together and separately, but let's, let's get a little bit more speculative in a moment and look forward. So Dave, I want to invite you back up to the okay. podium to talk a little bit about DARPA's view of the next few years. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get feedback from the rest of our panel. OK. Thanks. Yeah, hi again. This is going to be shorter. This has got to be two minutes, I think. And um, so if you'd bring up the slides for the AI future. So as I mentioned, there's this third wave that DARPA has been considering, right? And so I don't think we quite know what this should be. But uh, some basic ideas are the first wave really did a lot of work on reasoning and planning and a lot of substantial work on semantics. And there's a lot of benefit there that we haven't yet realized in AI systems. The machine learning wave has really made a lot of progress on perception in dealing with noisy environments, you know, in doing classification and prediction. One thing we need to do is find a way to reunite these, have systems that can do perception, build a model of the world, use that to explain and take action and reason about what should be done next. But in general, it's what are all the things we need to do to go beyond the simple function learning, you know, classification systems that we're getting out of machine learning today. So here are three sample projects of the ones we're doing in DARPA now. They're just examples of a few of the things we're doing in the third wave. First one is my current program, Explainable AI. So we're trying to find ways to have a machine learning system that not only can make decisions and give recommendations, but can explain to its user why it's done that. And that's not an easy problem. The next one is Hava Siegelman's program on lifelong learning machines, which is trying to look at the problem of if you have an AI system out in the world and it experiences a surprise, if the world has changed, how can it learn on its own to adapt to that new surprise. And then finally, one on assured autonomy, um, which is about how do you have a learning-enabled system but bring in ideas from software assurance and other disciplines so you can put some bounds on that. How can you have an autonomous system based on machine learning but one that can have uh, some constraints you know it's going to follow? So those are just samples of some of the things we're doing now. I think you're going to hear more from uh, Steve at the end of the, the session. But here are three kind of very broad strategic directions that we're considering going. One, common sense reasoning, which is kind of a placeholder for a whole bunch of problems that are keeping narrow AI systems we have today from being the more generalized intelligent systems we'd like to have. So how do we you know, work at these big problems in AI? Another area is to really kind of clean up the theoretical foundations of the current wave, right? How do we make sure these systems are more robust, that we have full understanding, that we can protect these systems from malicious adversarial attacks and that sort of thing. And then of course, finally, as DARPA always would, would be to just apply the current technology to a whole host of difficult uh, DOD problems. So that's kind of our summary of what we're thinking of doing. Thanks, Dave. Now, um, again, because we have such deep experts here, I've asked e each of these folks to spend two minutes this time uh, reflecting a little bit in their area of expertise on items that they find that are out there and talked up and have people wildly excited, which are by and large hype and completely overblown. 
um, as well as things that they're aware of, whether they've worked on themselves or their colleagues have, that are generally flying under the radar and are underappreciated and actually could really have a big impact on the field. So just want to get their opinions in different areas, and then we'll dive into some of the more subtle issues around AI and machine learning. So Rod, if we could, let's start. Yeah, with I want to start with something that, that I think people don't appreciate how hard it is, and we haven't made a lot of progress, and that's dexterous manipulation. And it's going to rely on better sensing, better materials, better actuators, and better algorithms, including hardcore control theory. Uh, and the limits on future applications of robots are, are really restricted by how much <coughs> dexterous manipulation we can do. Until we have automatic dexterous manipulation, we need humans in the last few inches between the cyber world and the physical world. Either the human hands doing the task or humans teleoperating. And as an example, in civilian logistics, i.e. fulfillment centers, uh, people right now do the actual picking from a shelf or a tote box, even though a robot may have brought that tote box to them, and then they do the packing those last few inches. It's really, really hard. And the hype is that we continually see um, people say that machine learning is going to do it all. Week after week, there's another story. There was one a couple of weeks ago with machine learning uh, moving an object in a hand in this orientation, not in this orientation, in this orientation, the headline said, see, we got dexterous manipulation almost solved. It took hundreds of simulated years of the hand moving that, it took untold amounts of energy in the cloud, and really, this sort of manipulation, it, and this is an actual number, it's only 0.01% of the whole problem. Um, it's a joke. Uh, <laughs> And it really, you know, what we don't know is how, you know, well, what we haven't done is how real dexterity of a real task requires at the, you know, few tens of milliseconds, the hand completely changing its strategy and switching between things. And that's what we're going to require physics, materials, and, and uh, control theory in, in all the solutions that we're going to get. It's not just machine learning. So Tom, Sorry, Tom. Okay. machine learning, we'll get to it in a minute more generally, but one of the most overused terms I suspect around AI, AI people, the field has been machine learning. You know more than most people, having been the chief learning officer, <laughs> um, maybe you still are, oh, um, yeah. but also having spent years in the field, I'm sure you have some really good observations on underappreciated and overhyped elements in, in learning. Well, yeah, let me maybe start with the overhype. I mean, of course, we are going to use machine learning to solve all those problems. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but, but I think right now the, 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 the area that's been most overhyped, I would say, is uh, the victories in Go and chess using machine learning, using reinforcement learning. Uh, of course, uh, it, those are great accomplishments for reinforcement learning, a, a field that uh, has had very few successes until recently. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to keep in mind that in Go or chess, you have a perfect knowledge of the world, right? Two, two player games of perfect information. You have perfect physics. You know exactly how all the pieces move. <clears throat> it's a closed world. And so virtually everything that matters about the real world and certainly about battle spaces is completely missing. From, from those settings. And so we're not going to go from being able to solve Go to self-driving cars or to grasping or to any of these things because those take place in a complex open world where there are all kinds of surprises possible. Um, so, uh, and then perhaps the, the thing that I think is uh, uh, flying under the radar is there's an area of machine learning called anomaly detection. Um, and DARPA has made some uh, big uh, investments in it recently with the Adams program and, uh, and currently under the Transparent Computing program, where uh, algorithms have devel been developed that from completely unlabeled data can learn what typical normal behavior is and then find anomalies that might be due to cyber intrusions, uh, employees stealing things, uh, financial fraud, and so on. Uh, and I think we can uh, also use these algorithms to help our AI systems notice when something unusual is happening, which might signal a, a failure in their own design, in the, in, the, in the lack of training data, in change in the world, and, and which will allow them to be more robust. Great, thanks. Bill. I'll just uh, add a little bit to what Rod and Tom have talked about. In, in terms of real and hype, I'm gonna say <coughs> that deep learning is both. 
Um, <laughs> the real part is spectacular results in some areas that have been long-time problems, speech recognition, image recognition, real step function improvements, and things that have been worked on for a long time. The hype part, as everybody's been saying, is the positioning of it. So <clears throat> as Raj was saying a little bit ago, speech is going to be a part of any real AI system, but it's only going to be, speech recognition anyway, is only going to be a small part of it. So, Given all this great advance in machine learning, deep learning in particular, how does that fit into an overall scheme, an overall problem that we're trying to solve? So my example of something that's um, kind of flying under the radar has to do with problem solving. So problem solving in AI conjures up sort of a form, set of formal ideas and things like that. But if we think about how we solve problems at work or at home, we're almost always working with other people to solve the problem. And we do that through conversation. And this is not conversation for social purpose, although there can be a social component to it. It's true collaborative problem solving. You're presenting ideas, the other person's presenting another idea, you build on each other, you, you signal where you disagree, where you agree, where you're uncertain. We don't have computer systems that are anywhere close to being able to do that. However, there has been a steady but slow rise in conversational capabilities. So Siri is just the barest conversation. It's really mostly about a one-turn interaction. We're seeing a tiny bit more. We saw a little bit more with Google Duplex. I think this is going to be a huge area in the future. Ash. So I'm going to paint a number of futures. I don't know whether DARPA is going to fund all of them, but <laughs> they should. Uh, first of all, I think we are on the verge of being able to, I can speak in Hindi and, um, you know, Ron can hear it in English and back and forth, we can have a complete conversation without any break. The technology is there now, but kind of getting that technology for all languages of the world is not there yet. There are many sparse languages, and they, the, if you leave it to just business, that will never happen. The same technology can be used to dub every movie so that where, no matter where I am in the world, no matter what language I speak, you can actually hear that movie in my language, <laughs> dynamically in real time. That's another thing, so, because the world needs entertainment. <laughs> Especially, I know of many villages where they don't go to golf course when they want entertainment, they just sit in front of the TV, okay? And then there are a number of other things like an intelligent agent, no matter whether you're literate or not, will pay your bills, answer your email, and order your groceries. An intelligent agent may even do things that you don't know how to do, like knowing that there's going to be a tsunami, there's going to be a traffic jam, or whatever other things, that you, as a human being, cannot do, but your intelligent agent can do. And the, 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 these guardian angel technologies, I think, are going to be very important. If we had it, we wouldn't have the Malaysian Airways thing. Every aircraft would have a guardian angel. So, uh, now, going into the 20 to 50 year future, there are lots of things that may be possible. But I'm not sure I want to be online with it. I think we're about to kind of witness technologies that make us omniscient, that is know everything, omnipresent, be everywhere, and omnipotent and immortal, right? Now I have to explain what I mean. For the first three, I recommend you go and watch the Eye in the Sky movie, 2015 movie, which uses the DARPA-created hummingbird robot to demonstrate all the first three. 
know, know every, be everywhere, know everything, and do something about it. The immortal, you have to redefine what you mean by immortal. If you have a new body every 20 years, <laughs> that, is that immortal? Maybe. So basically, I think what we need to kind of get to is the kinds of things that we know how to, might happen, but who is going to fund it? Where is the big, uh, you know, let me call it the Manhattan Project. That's what John McCarthy said. Before we can have human level AI, he said, we need 1.7 Einsteins, three Maxwells, and 0.7 Manhattan Project. <laughs> Until the DARPA and the government decide that's what they want, these things can be done but won't happen. So I'll let you decide for yourselves which parts of what Raj said were underappreciated, under the radar, and which were a bit of hype. Um, but uh, you mentioned the term Manhattan Project, and we talked about grand challenges. One of the almost ironies of AI is that we probably need some gigantic Manhattan Project to create an AI system that has the competence of a three-year-old. Right? We've had expert systems in the past. We have very robust robotic systems to a degree. We know how to recognize images in giant databases of photographs. But the aggregate, um, including what people have called common sense from time to time, Dave alluded to some uh, uh, upcoming DARPA efforts in those areas, it's still quite elusive in the field. Sort of the combination of robust behavior in the face of noise and unexpected situations, multiple types of learning, which we should talk about, having background knowledge, thinking, putting all those together, that's kind of a Manhattan Project scale and, uh, thing for the, for the field. So um, I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on, for example, the combination of knowledge, if you will, and reasoning, maybe hearkening back a little bit to the first wave, um, or whether we should just continue down the road of thinking of machine learning as being synonymous with deep learning, um, or whether there are other magical ingredients or technological ingredients we haven't addressed yet. Well, we're, many people now are working on combining symbolic knowledge and to some extent reasoning with statistical machine learning techniques, including deep learning. And it only makes sense because um, in many, many fields, almost all fields, we know things that we would like to tell the system so that it doesn't have to learn them. Okay. And that, so they, there's a big waste of data and cycles, as Rod was pointing out earlier. So I, that work's already going on, and I think we need more of it. It might be good to have a challenge problem to yeah. bring that together. But there was a fair amount of that even in PAL, more in probabilistic relational models than in deep learning. I think that's, deep learning doesn't have that connection yet. And most, most problems, most real problems don't actually have enough data to make deep right. learning effective. Right. So you have to do something to be able to learn from small data. Tom, I don't know if you want to comment on uh, the well, expanse of machine learning in the I mean, there, are, yeah, there certainly are many, many forms of learning, and of course, I myself don't do deep learning very much. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I, I, I mean that in research. Maybe I do it in my brain. <laughs> um, uh, but, but I think, but I think the, particularly the computer vision community had this, uh, you know, very important lesson that, that was learned in the last decade, which was, you know, up, up through the 90s and, and into the 2000s, uh, computer vision researchers were trying to guess what is the intermediate representation between the raw image and the high-level concept. And they designed uh, histograms of gradients and uh, sifts and so on. And uh, it turned out that when we used deep learning to, to design those instead, it did much better. And so the, the, uh, the lesson learned from that is we're not very good at designing representations. And all that hand-coding representation is maybe wasted effort or we've got to figure out how we can get computers to uh, using machine learning tools to learn useful intermediate representations that then people could also help with. I mean, so right. where's the right place for the bridge? I, you know, I'm very skeptical that our 
purely logical representations are representing very much knowledge in reality. Mm -hmm. Because we see, I mean, the reason machine learning wins is there's millions of exceptions to everything. And so all those training examples are teaching the system something about a lot of special cases. And when you try to write that down as a general rule, hey, in order to try to explain it to the user, you're giving a very approximate account. Yeah. Um, dealing with those kinds of situations is really pretty important. Um, and in particular, there's clearly many activities in the real world where we don't have access, as humans at least, to oodles and oodles of training examples, or in fact, to get them would be extremely dangerous, or is they're impossible to obtain. For example, if you're gonna build an adaptable rover to run around another planet, right. we don't have any way to get training examples without just getting out there and starting to do experiments. Um, but Raj, there's a, there, you talked about these wonderful potential futures for language translation, language technology. Um, one of the key challenges we have, and certainly this is true for the military, is that we have almost no resources for a very large number of languages. So if you're trying to translate between French and English, you go to the Canadian Parliament and you've got <laughs> unbelievable amounts of cross-listed language instances. Um, and we have many, many other examples in speech and simultaneous translation, but there's many languages for which we don't have training examples. How does it work in the speech and language understanding community to bootstrap when you have almost no resources to work from? Before I answer that question, can I go back to the learning <laughs> and say something heretical? Everything is brute force learning. Everything is an exception. We, we have so many, so much, so many cells, lots of things we keep learn is simply a specific examples of things. And, uh, and therefore, trying to kind of impose some formal structure and other kinds of things sometimes helps. The, where you need the, the formalization is when you want to generalize and use anal analogy for learning. But most of the time, if I told you Brzezinski, I'm not going to generalize on Brzezinski. <laughs> it, it goes in, it's a name and, or whatever. And, and so the issue, I think, is for us to accept the fact we'll have unlimited memory, unlimited computation. Therefore, we'll store everything. One of the reasons the, speak, you know, the, the current speech technology works so well is they're training on 10 million hours of speech. When we were working on it, one, one hour of speech was already very hard to do. So, so we need to kind of begin to see when you have unlimited computation, the reason deep learning works is because of unlimited computation. And until, that, until, until we had supercomputer power available to them, huge supercomputer, like cloud computing, it would not have worked. That's why they had to wait till 2012 or, you know. Anyway, coming back to the, the, the speech question, I think the, what we call orphan languages, nobody's going to work on it. And DARPA, Defense Department, has a unique need because they end up in strange parts of the world where they need to be able to work with local people. In that sense, you know, that rapid acquisition of orphan language, the, the, the vocabulary and the grammar and, and the use is a very important part of the technology. Well, and DARPA's had a program or two in that, right? right. They recognize that it's, hard. it's a hard problem. Okay, I want to change gears for a moment, almost literally. Um, Rod, you're probably the best observer here on this. In the history of AI, what's your sense of how important it is for AI experimental systems that we build have some kind of a physical embodiment? Um, you know, at the very beginning, AI focused on chess playing and checkers and problem solving and logic proofs and even expert systems, all of which were completely disembodied. Um, but when we started to get the grand challenges and the like, we had to put all that stuff in something that moved around, interacted with the world. Is that just a, an artifact and not really important? Or is that fundamental to where we go next in the field? Well, I, I think, you know, we could argue that a lot of what deep learning has, has done and has achieved, uh, besides the infinite computation, is because in most applications, there's still a person in the loop. There's a person arguing with 
Alexa or arguing with Siri <laughs> to get the right thing. As a person looking at the, the uh, rank pages uh, of images or whatever and decide, you know, doing some of the, the interpretation. When you directly couple the intelligence to the physical world without a person in the loop, you don't have that luxury of the human brain being in there. And so it forces a certain humility you, your achievement level is a lot less. Hasn't always been a strength of AI people, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, None so, of the people so, on this panel included. And, and, and so, and so um, uh, you know, getting a physical system to work in the, in, the, in the real world means you have to solve all the problems and you can't bury some of them in the, in the person who's in the loop, who's way, way better than any AI system we have at the moment. Yeah. Bill, did you want to say anything about Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that. Um, so I'm a, I'm a great believer that embodiment drives the field forward for the reasons that Rod was talking about. But it doesn't have to be physical embodiment. So as especially these days, software systems live in a very uncertain real world and it has exactly the same kind of characteristic. Right. Right. Uh, before we wrap up, oh, did you? Well, I was just going to say, if you want to learn about the physical world, it's super important to be in, in, uh, embodied in it. But if you want to learn about the social world or the cultural world, now our, we have computer systems that are Im embedded in those worlds, too. And so we need both. Yep. And, and I, I have a, a theory that the physical world will actually be much easier because we do have physics. Yep. And so we can build much better <laughs> simulators for some things. Not actual physical interaction is a tough one. but. Uh, uh, but geometry we're good at. Uh, whereas for the social world, because we, we have much more difficulty making good simulations, it's much more challenging. Okay, I had one last kind of question before we wrap up. Um, it's kind of interesting in a way. You all recall that in the original days of IPTO and the DARPA approach to AI, um, Licklider talked about what he called man-machine symbiosis. Um, there are a number of people now in the AI world who are talking about maybe we should worry less about fully autonomous robots and the like, and think much more about AI's place in the world in the next couple of decades as in partnership with, with humans in some way or another. Um, now, Rod, you just mentioned how having a human in the mix changes the nature of the problems, but you also quite a few years ago wrote an extremely interesting and provocative book talking about physical integration of bionic, robotic, AI elements with human bodies. What's, what's your feeling now looking forward about working humans and, and AI systems working closely together, or is it more interesting to focus on more autonomous systems? Um, I, I, I think that we are going to push autonomous systems as much as we can, but we won't get as far as we think we will. So we will rely on people being in the loop for all sorts of things, uh, in, in the loop in some sort of form or another. Um, you know, this gets to the social questions about, uh, is AI going to destroy all the jobs? I, I don't think so. I think people are going to be very critical with most AI systems for certain parts, which we just cannot get the AI systems to do in the short term. If you go out, you know, Raj talks about going out 30 or 40 years, I think all bets are off. But in the next decade or two, most of our systems are going to have a lot more human interaction than some people imagine. And where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, right now on that, I think is in autonomous driving. That it's, you know, if you go back two years, people were talking about 2018, 2019, 2020, having autonomous vehicles on the roads by that time. And I think we sort of see that's not happening <laughs> just yet. So how are we going to geofence the world, change our cities, have purely autonomous systems in very restricted environments, and then where people and the, the, the uh, robotic cars interact is going to be, um, I think, a, a rich area for, for a lot of research over the next few years. Yeah. In fact, the, the autonomous, semi-autonomous vehicles is a place you're going to see it where there's going to be physical risk if they interact with pedestrians and human drivers, but there's lots of other places now where we're seeing AI systems or partial AI systems in the world interacting with regular humans. I don't know whether you'd argue that Siri, Alexa, and the like looks are truly that way, but they feel to naive humans like they're people you could have full-fledged conversations with, right? I don't know what reaction has been to the Roomba, but um, certainly dogs and cats probably think 
they're pretty interesting <laughs> items, right? A lot, of, a lot of people give Roombas names. They buy clothes for them. <laughs> um, I wouldn't have believed that. But interestingly, the PackBot in Iraq and Afghanistan with a, a Bombtex, Bombtex bonded with those robots too, which we totally didn't expect. Whoa, interesting. Yeah, so in fact, we're, we're no doubt in the next couple decades, again, you're right, maybe in four, six decades, all bets are off in a way, but over the next few, we're gonna be living in a world where there are partially intelligent, if you will, non-human systems interacting with us in our cars, in our shopping, in our military bases, et cetera. Do we have enough of a handle yet on how people will successfully operate when they're dealing with systems where they don't quite know where they start and stop and what they're capable of, um, and the systems may not be self-aware enough to tell the humans that they don't know something or they can't do something. How, how's that gonna work out, and should, are there things that DARPA should be doing to focus on that kind of mixed autonomy world? Um, yeah, well, we, we are trying to. I mean, we know that's a big problem. Explainable AI is a piece of that. I guess it was a setup for that, but um, uh, you know, trust, I think we, we're gonna find out, right? One, there's an argument you just, if you use any kind of automated system, after a while you build a model of what it can do, right? So that'd probably happen, but you'd like to find ways to accelerate that. Right. And I think how we have these systems communicate effectively with people, especially in the kind of problem solving yeah. dialogue you're describing, uh, is pretty difficult because we speak such a different language and the automated systems as you often find out from Siri or Alexa, don't even have a basic understanding of what's going on in your world. Well, so. I'll just point out that we, we human beings, this is why I was talking about conversation earlier, we human beings have very sophisticated ways of figuring out the things, people that we're interacting with, their state of knowledge, their state yeah, of right. agreement. We're, we're really great at that. And we're not right, so, doing that. So way. maybe, Dave, we need a direction, not that there's anything wrong with explainable AI, but maybe we should start thinking about building partially intelligent systems that are understandable. Understandable AI sure. so you can plunk it in front well, of a normal and human there's being. Actually, one of, the, one of the programs they have now communicating with computers that Paul Cohen exactly. is looking at. Which, much of which collaborative problem solving, but it's the a very... The original vision, which is right, right. pretty cool given that IPTO started it all. Well, and the other reason we need the, 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 the two systems together is that our AI systems continue to be very narrow. Right. And certainly our machine learning systems, uh, machine learning gives us another way of building an idiot savant, uh, <laughs> but it doesn't solve the generality problem. And so it's the human that brings the context, uh, the social part, all of that, uh, because the computer doesn't know it. Good. Well, thank you all. I think that was a very important point to, to conclude with. To wrap up, what I thought I'd do is just ask our panels to spend a very brief moment each talking about what they think is the most important thing for the field to focus on over roughly the next decade or so. 10 years isn't sacred, use the time period you want, but sort of if, if you had all the money, whatever that is, or you could drive the right talent to work on some part of the AI universe, where would you put your bet? So Bill, why don't I start with you? I've already said it. Um, I would be working on systems that can partner with people and that know how to interact with people to really get things done together. Raj? Learning. Learning by example, learning by doing, learning by think, uh, discovery. There, there are so many different aspects of learning, not just deep learning, that we need to work on. And I would invest huge amounts of money in learning. Dave? Um, common sense reasoning. I'm pitching, I'm pitching a new program on Monday, so <laughs> uh, that's Clearly a big hard problem. It's, you know, what do you do next is kind of the issue there, but yeah. that's And right. it's an eternal one so far, at least for AI, right? People talked about right. common right. sense reasoning decades ago. Right. Tom? Well, and it really should be called common sense knowledge, I think. The reasoning right. part will be easier than the knowledge part. But uh, hmm. uh, I guess, uh, you know, I'm very concerned about robustness because particularly from DARPA's point of view, we want to have these systems in life and death situations in the battlefield or in the self-driving car or in the surgical suite. 
and uh, our current uh, technology in AI, we have focused on performance, performance, performance. I mean, the issue came up before yeah. in looking yeah. at VLSI, and, and, and now people actually want to use the stuff, and we're going, oh, oh, wait a second. We didn't think about maintainability, diagnosability, uh, oh. verification, validation, safety, and so uh, systems that have models of their own competence, systems that can communicate those, uh, systems that we can verify and validate, these are huge challenges. Great, Rod. Um, we as humankind have been working on chemistry for at least 2,000 years, and there's been great economic incentive converting lead to gold. But we've had to change our theories of chemistry multiple, multiple times. There's still a lot of chemistry we don't understand. Perhaps uh, our current theories of how to do AI are not going to last too long. And if we take John McCarthy and we get that, that if it's a single person who's 1.7 Einsteins, they're going to come up with a new theory. Einstein came up with a few different new theories, as Newton did also. So I'd figure out some way to fund some really radical young mavericks and see what happens. <laughs> I would put my money on developing new talent like all of you. Have you teach the next generation the way you think, what you've been through over the last, let's just call it a few decades, so that people can learn from the past, and also we can multiply the strength of the field because there's too few of you around. So I want to thank all of you so much for spending time with us and sharing your your great insights. Um, last comment, as you can see from Dave's history in our discussion, DARPA has stuck with the field for almost 60 full years. Um, it's pretty incredible through up and down through the so-called winters and through changes of personnel and different um, theories of the day, the agency has been a major driver for the entire history of this field. Um, as you can also tell, AI, whether it's one or many problems woven together, is really, really difficult. And we're not anywhere near close to the answer. So we hope and we think it's really important that DARPA can continue for a very long period of time to stick with it, not be impatient. Look how far we've gotten in 60 years. I'd love to come back in another 60 years and do this again with you all. <laughs> different body. Well, he well, says we're going to be immortal. We're yeah, going to get the immortal stuff worked yeah. out. Right. Um, and I want to thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you for being here. And uh, I want to thank our panelists one last time. <laughs>